Wales is the founder of Wikipedia, in, which he started on January the 15th in 2001. And here we are a little over five years later, and it's the world's largest encyclopedia. And it's all y'all's fault. <laughs> helping make it possible because everybody here can and probably several of you have been Wikipedians, our contributors. Uh, Jimmy Wales has been an internet entrepreneur and a pioneer in using wikis and collaborative software. He was born in Huntsville, Alabama and spent a long time looking over the world book, which I think inspired Wikipedia. He first attended Auburn University and then the University of Alabama so that he could round out his undergraduate studies, not being too heavy on either one. Later, he took PhD courses in finance at the University of Alabama and at Indiana. And he always says he did not write his doctoral dissertation. Um, he later went on to be a futures and options trader. And since the founding of Wikipedia, Jimmy has been on the board of several not-for-profits now, um, and is also a fellow at the Berkman Center at Harvard University at um, the Berkman Center for Law and Internet and Society. And we're going to let Jimmy give us an update on Wikipedia and on what it means. Wikipedia has some new projects that some of you guys are probably aware of. Wikibooks is probably the newest in which you can help write free textbooks, not only for here, but to be shared in the world as they're translated because they're all on free translation licenses. So there's one of the projects, and I'm going to get out of the way and let Jimmy talk. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take about 50 minutes, I hope. We'll see how my timing is, and then we'll have questions afterwards. In such a large group as this, it's a little hard to take questions as I go along. So if you've got questions, please, let's just hold them to the end. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about what is Wikipedia. Now, obviously, um, everyone in here seems to know the basics of what it is, but I'm going to go into a little more detail. I'm going to tell you about how the community works, which is uh, the, the secret of how the success of Wikipedia. I'm going to talk about the core principles of the Wikimedia Foundation, and then I'm going to talk about some things that I think are going to be free in the future. So, how many, first of all, how many people here have, uh, well, everybody knows what Wikipedia is. How many people have actually edited Wikipedia? Pretty good, pretty good. How many people here would call themselves a Wikipedian? We don't have any Wikipedians here. Oh, my. So, um, in 1962, Charles Van Doren, who was later a senior editor at Britannica, said the ideal encyclopedia should be radical. It should stop being safe. But if you know the history of Britannica since 1962, it's been anything but radical. It's still a very, very safe, uh, very safe um, reference work. Wikipedia, on the other hand, starts with a very radical idea, which is for all of us to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. And that's what we're doing at Wikipedia. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is our nonprofit organization, which I founded. Uh, the aim of the Wikimedia Foundation, the central aim, is to distribute that free encyclopedia to every single person on the planet. And uh, the foundation is responsible for Wikipedia and all of the sister projects. And I'll tell you a little bit about those sister projects uh, in a little while. We're funded uh, primarily from small donations from the general public. We did get a few uh, larger donations. And we're also partnering with select institutions. So for example, Yahoo has donated servers for us to use in our South Korea facility. And there's a Dutch educational consortium called Kinesnet, which uh, has supplied us with servers in Amsterdam. So we are starting to partner with some larger organizations. So, um, as when Paul asked, does anybody here not know what Wikipedia is? Nobody raised their hand, so this slide might be redundant, but I think there's still some important uh, points to go into. If you've just seen Wikipedia on the internet and you've used it as a reference source, you might not really realize some of the philosophy and the methods that go on. So the basic definition of Wikipedia is that it's a freely licensed encyclopedia written by thousands of volunteers in many languages. So the freely licensed part is one of the most important things 
to understand about what we do. So what do I mean by free? If you're familiar with the free software movement, uh, these ideas are very familiar. So if you think about um, all the software that really runs the in internet, Apache, GNU Linux, uh, PHP, all these things are freely licensed. And the idea of freely licensed software is not free as in beer, but free as in speech. And so there are four freedoms which define free software. This was come up with, uh, these four freedoms were defined by Richard Stallman many years ago. You have the freedom to copy our work. You have the freedom to modify it. You have the freedom to redistribute it. And you have the freedom to redistribute modified versions. And you can do all of this commercially or non-commercially. So when we say freely licensed, we're basically saying, here it is. Take it. Do as you wish with it. People can adapt it. They can do whatever they want with it. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more than just saying we don't charge you money for it. So uh, how big is Wikipedia? Uh, Wikipedia, is, English Wikipedia is the largest, has, has over 500 million words. Uh, that means it's more than twice the size of Britannica. Um, I actually haven't been able to get any uh, statistics recently to figure out exactly how big. I think it's probably three or four times larger than Britannica now. Uh, and then the German language Wikipedia is equal in size to Brockhaus. Brockhaus is the equivalent, it's the Britannica of the German language essentially. So those are the two largest projects. But we're in many, many languages. It's a fully global project. So we have over 750,000 articles in English. We have almost 300,000. I think in the next few days we're going to hit the 300,000 mark in German. We have over 100,000 in French, Japanese, Polish, Italian, and Swedish. And we have over 50,000 in Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese. And all of these are growing really quickly. We've got 2.2 million articles total across 200 languages. But Saying 200 languages is really overstating the case. I don't like to use that number as a statistic. What I like to talk about is that we have 30 languages now that have at least 10,000 articles. And we have 75 languages with at least 1,000 articles. So 1,000 articles is not a very comprehensive encyclopedia, obviously. But 1,000 articles is the point at which I say, yes, there's a small community. There's a group of people working there. And they're actually starting to make some progress. To give an example of a smaller language, Wikipedia, that's uh, in that group would be Arabic. Arabic now has about 7,000 articles. Um, that's pretty disappointing for a language that has such uh, global importance. However, it is growing about 10% a month. And so it'll only be a few years until Arabic Wikipedia is as large and important as English Wikipedia. So we have some other projects. Um, obviously, Wikipedia is one. Uh, Wiktionary. Wiktionary is a dictionary project. So this is an effort to create the largest uh, dictionary in history. Uh, it's also proceeding in many, many languages. It got started a little slower. One of the reasons is that an encyclopedia article itself is fairly standalone and is useful from the very beginning. A dictionary only starts to become useful once it gets lots and lots and lots of words. Most people don't need a dictionary that only has a few words in it. It doesn't really do you much good. But now we're starting to see it become uh, increasingly useful and is attracting more and more volunteers. Wikibooks. So Wikibooks is not one of our newer projects, but it's newly in the media for some reason. I think the reason is uh, I accidentally made an inflammatory statement to a reporter about uh, turning the textbook industry upside down. And everybody loves it when I make an inflammatory statement. And so now there's been all this news coverage in the last couple of weeks, most of which seems to think we've just announced the project. But it's been around for a few years. We've got um, I think like 10,000 modules started. Uh, that would be essentially similar to a chapter in a book. Um, Wikibooks is actually my personal favorite. I think this is one of the most important things that we are doing. Wikipedia is very famous and very successful. The idea of Wikibooks is to create a complete curriculum, kindergarten through the university level, um, with freely licensed textbooks all the way up. I consider this to be a core part of our central mission to give everyone on the planet an encyclopedia. Because what we mean by that is something deeper than just uh, spamming the planet with CDs, like AOL CDs, saying, here's your free encyclopedia. What we mean is we want you to be able to actually use it. And so for many, many people, to use Wikipedia, which is written at a level that's suitable, uh, it varies from article to article, but it's generally suitable for advanced high school to college students and beyond. That doesn't do you any good if you don't know how to read. And so we want to also give people all the literacy materials, everything they need to bring themselves up to the point where they can actually use the encyclopedia. We want to make that available freely. Um, if you think about that, that's a much bigger job than the encyclopedia itself for the same reason that if you think about a traditional encyclopedia, it's about yay big on the shelf. And you think about all the books that you would need for kindergarten through a university level education, it would be uh, several shelves of books. And so 
Wikibooks is going to take a longer period of time to come to fruition, but it's something uh, that's well underway and we're very excited about. Wikiquote is a smaller project. That's a, an example of a project that, that grew out of the community's um, tensions within the social tensions within the community. People started putting way too many quotes from famous people into articles and fighting about that. Uh, and somebody said, well, wait a minute, you know, really, uh, Bartlett's familiar quotations is a separate type of reference work. That stuff should really be moved out. So now it's okay to have two or three famous quotes from Colin Powell, for example, but you don't put 30 quotes into an encyclopedia article. You move those out into wiki quotes. So that's, that's one of the ways we deal with things uh, within the community. When we have a fight, we just try to find a way to accommodate everybody. Wikimedia Commons uh, was born out of a desire to unify all of our media files. So. Um, several years ago, if you were looking for a photo of the Eiffel Tower to put into the English Wikipedia, you would naturally go and look in the French Wikipedia because you would think, well, maybe some French person's taken a picture and you would be right. You would be able to get a photo there. But if you were looking for something, a photo of something in Thailand, it probably wouldn't occur to you to look in the Dutch Wikipedia. But in fact, that would have been a great place to look because there's a very prominent Wikipedian who's a Dutchman who lives in Thailand and he takes pictures of things in Thailand and uploads them to the Dutch Wikipedia. Well, that wasn't very good because uh, this is language neutral stuff. And so we decided let's collect all the media files into one Wikimedia Commons, have it be a language neutral place in many languages. Uh, that is well underway. Right now there's about 200,000 media files uh, in Wikimedia Commons. And in Wikimedia Commons, we're very, very strict about the licensing. In the English Wikipedia, we do allow fair use, which is really an American concept uh, in copyright law. This varies across the entire world. Uh, we're a global project, so harmonizing with the copyright laws all over the world is very, very difficult. Wikimedia Commons, we try to make sure everything in there is freely usable pretty much anywhere on the planet. We can't comply with the laws of every country, like North Korea, for example, but um, we try to comply with all reasonable copyright laws uh, of all countries in Wikimedia Commons. Wikinews is really our, our newest large project. Uh, Wikinews came, uh, the, the original inspiration for Wikinews is that we had seen what Wikipedia does with breaking news events. So a lot of our stories have gotten a lot of media attention because they're so good about breaking news events. A good example would be the tsunami. When the tsunami happened, you could turn on CNN and you could see footage over and over and over, dramatic footage from people on vacation, and oh my God, the water's coming, ah, you know. But you didn't get a lot of information about who lives there, who are the people, what, what language do they speak, what's their government like, what's the history of the region. And so our articles are always like that. They're always quite good, filling in huge amounts of background information, and they get a lot of attention because of that. And so based on that, we thought that we would give a try to Wikinews. So Wikinews has been in existence for uh, nearly a year now, I suppose, and uh, it's doing very well. It's growing, uh, constantly growing, attracting contributors. What I always try to do uh, when I'm interviewed about it is downplay it and say it's still a very young project because when we started with Wikipedia for the first couple of years, nobody noticed or cared, and so we were able to make all kinds of mistakes. Now that Wikipedia is famous, of course, Wikinews gets a lot of attention. Uh, even though it's still a small community. So my, I, I view my role is to sort of defend that community and say, wait a minute, nobody should expect this to be good yet. We'll wait um, a few more years and then we'll start saying that it's good. For now, it's an experiment and, and I really want people to experiment with it and find out you know, what's the best way to do this. So how popular is Wikipedia? This is some of the fun stuff that I like to do. Um, we're now a top 40 website. Um, according to Alexa.com, which is a firm which ranks websites based on the amount of traffic that they have. We have a broader reach. That means more total individual people see us. We have a broader reach than the New York Times, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, MSNBC.com, the Chicago Tribune. And the fun thing is we have a broader reach than all of these combined. <laughs> so whenever reporters call me up to ask me something about, well, what about the mainstream media? I, I'd say, well, who's the mainstream media now? Maybe it's us. <laughs> get these fringe publications calling me up. I don't know really if I should talk to them. Um, we have about 2 billion page views monthly. So that's, that's a substantial amount of traffic. Uh, this is a fun graph. So one of the things to remember is that we are an almost exclusively volunteer organization. We now have two employees. We have our lead software developer. 
Uh, and then I have a personal assistant who just, because I'm always traveling, so just recently I got an assistant in the office, basically a secretary to answer the phone and uh, keep up with the paperwork. And I'm a volunteer. Everybody else is a volunteer. About.com was sold, um, I think they were sold about here. This is About.com for $410 million to the New York Times. And now our traffic, this is a graph of our traffic, our traffic is way higher than theirs. So it's a lot of fun for us as volunteers that we've built this website that were at a commercial enterprise would be a substantial multi-hundred million dollar enterprise. Um, the hardware that we run on, we've got over 100 servers and multiple data centers. So we have servers in Florida, Amsterdam, South Korea, and Paris. And all of these servers are managed by volunteers. We have volunteer system administrators who are online basically 24 hours a day. There's an IRC channel where they all meet and discuss what's going on. They keep the servers running um, all the time. And it's really a lot of fun for them to know that they're building a data center, building out this whole system, which competes very favorably with major corporate websites, which employ generally hundreds of people. This is the, the graph. I know this isn't really a technical talk and our technical audience, but I think it's important to, to sort of give you a quick overview of how it all works um, so that you can really stop and think about what does it mean to have volunteers running such a complicated system. So this is the internet out there up in the corner. This is you out there and you're going to request a page. When you request a page, you request it from the squids. The squids are caching servers. Basically, if they've seen the page before, they remember it and they can give you the page very quickly. If, you, if you're not logged in and if they've already seen the page, they just give it to you. If they don't know the page, they have to get it from the Apaches. Apaches are web server machines. The web servers actually have to compute what's on the page. They have to actually process it and figure out what that page is supposed to be. And they do that by querying the database servers where all the data is ultimately stored. There's a few other servers, NFS file server, name server, mail server, things like that. And this is actually a very old picture. You have to, the, the architecture is basically the same, but you just have to add lots and lots of machines and data centers and things to this to get an idea of how it all works. So kind of amazing that, that volunteers are able to do all this. Uh, so there are two views of Wikipedia, two views of how the community works. How do we actually get the work done? Uh, one view talks about Wikipedia as an emergent phenomenon, pseudo-Darwinian. And the other view is that there's a community of thoughtful users. So to, to describe that first view, the, the quasi-Darwinian type of view, a former Britannic editor wrote a critique of Wikipedia in which he said, some unspecified quasi-Darwinian process will assure that those writings and editings by contributors of the greatest expertise will survive. Articles will eventually reach a steady state that corresponds to the highest degree of accuracy. Does someone actually believe this? Evidently so. I almost know that by, by memory, but not, not quite. Um, does somebody actually believe this? Evidently so. So when I read this, I thought, well, this is interesting because this is not the way we talk about ourselves within the community. We don't talk about it being a quasi-Darwinian process or some sort of emergent phenomenon from interaction. Uh, we don't think of ourselves as ants. This is the type of metaphor that people use. Lots of little ants doing something. The ants don't understand the behavior of the entire ant colony, but somehow something emerges from this. Thousands of users who don't know each other each contribute a little bit and somehow uh, coherent body of work emerges. The alternative view is that Wikipedia is a community, that there's a dedicated group of a few hundred volunteers who know each other and communicate constantly and they're always working to ensure the quality of the content. So you can sort of see my bias because I put up uh, pictures of my friends from my travels. Um, I go all over and I meet with Wikipedians and they do know each other and things like that. But there are implications for these two views for my role in the project. My, my goal in life is to give this free, high quality encyclopedia to every single person on the planet. The wiki methods that we use, the, the anarchy and chaos of the site, those are all secondary. Those are, those are not the important thing. The important thing is the quality of the work and our mission. And so when I heard this and I started to think about it, I thought, well, gee, what if all these people who are around me are just people who like to talk to me in email? And they have a lot of opinions and we all debate everything. But maybe that's not the way the work's being done. Maybe the work is actually something like a million people each adding one sentence each. So I wanted to do some research into the edit history. If we have an emergent model, then we need some kind of reputation mechanism. So most of you would probably be familiar with eBay. When you go on eBay, you can look and you can see the votes for if somebody's done good or not. 
The reason that eBay is successful is those reputation metrics, because you can know if you can trust somebody. But the reason they need the reputation mechanisms is that eBay is not actually a community. Now, there are some communities within eBay, so all the antique dealers who know each other, all the Pokemon collectors who know each other. But in general, eBay itself is not a community. And I, as a user of the site, when I go on there, I don't know anybody, and I don't know anybody who knows anybody. So I have to use this artificial metric. Individual users are tiny in that kind of a system. I can block somebody from editing, and so what? There's a million more. It's just like stomping on one ant. So what? It doesn't affect the colony. The community model is very different, though. The community model says that reputation isn't something an artificial metric can capture. Reputation is a natural outgrowth of human interactions. It's just like the reputation mechanism you would have in a university faculty or any type of organization where you would say, uh, you know, this person is really, really good in this area, but not so good in the other area. Or this person does good work, but boy, this guy's a complete jerk. Uh, those are the kinds of reputation that it's really hard to capture in any kind of metric. But humans know this stuff. Humans meet each other. They learn about each other. You learn to deal with people. You learn to get some work done. You work around people's personality problems, things like that. It also means that these users, the people who are around me and who talk about me, uh, talk about, I don't know if they talk about me or not, but they talk about the project and, and our plans for the future. They're very important. They are actually powerful because they're the people doing the work and they have to be respected. So when I started looking at this, I said, well, who, who is actually editing Wikipedia? And I thought I would find something like an 80-20 rule that 80% of the work was done by 20% of the users. That's the kind of thing that you find very often. But it turns out it's actually much, much tighter than that. The most recent numbers that we have, these are from July, show that 50% of all of the edits done, this is in the English Wikipedia, 50% of all the edits that have ever been done to English Wikipedia were done by just 0.7% of all the users, which is 615 people. And the most active 2% have done uh, around 70, 2% have done about 75%. These are weird numbers. That's just the way my program calculates them. 2% uh, of the users have done 75% of all the edits. This is the core community. And when I look down a list of these 615, I pretty much know all of them. Or if I don't know them, I can click on their work, and I can see that they're interacting with people who I do know. So it's a small community of people who either we know each other or some, you know somebody who knows somebody. We do have edits by anonymous users. Uh, so you can go to any page of Wikipedia and you can click edit this page and you'll, you can change the page and hit save. That's true of almost every page of Wikipedia. The only exceptions are pages like the front page of the site. Uh, we got tired of taking down giant penis pictures when they would show up there. Um, very, uh, very rarely we will also protect pages if there's a huge edit war that's broken out, things like that. Um, we sometimes have to protect pages when they're suddenly in the news. So for example, um, when, we, when the new pope was named, we ended up having to protect that page for a few hours because someone kept putting up a, uh, a photo of the emperor from Star Wars instead of his photo, <laughs> right? Um, so that was pretty good. I mean, we thought that was funny, but uh, not really appropriate. Um, the, uh, so you can edit this page, and, and you can do it without logging in. However, um, although anonymous IP numbers can edit Wikipedia, and they do, this turns out to be a fairly small amount of the overall work that's done. Uh, those edits make up about 18% of the total, and there's some evidence of a downward trend over time. It used to be 22%, then 20%, and the most recent number is around 18%. And anecdotally, a lot of those edits are by actually by regular users who are not logged in. So either they, they've logged out because they want to make an edit sort of anonymously, or they, as I always do, I always forget to log in. So I make a little edit and I forget to log in, so it shows up as an anonymous edit. So how does this community ensure quality? How, do, how does the software empower people to do good work? M what most people, um, when you look at Wikipedia and you try to assess the quality, uh, you can say that on average the quality is very, very high. In some cases, you'll find articles that are very, very bad. So you have to come to it with a little bit of sense about yourself as to what it is you're looking at. But given the way that we do it, it's astounding that it just um, is anything but, but crap. I mean, how could it be any good at all? We let anybody edit, right? So how do we do this? Well. Real-time peer review is an important part of the whole process. So um, basically, every edit to the site goes onto the Recent Changes page. The Recent Changes are reviewed by hundreds of people. Uh, users can set up personal watch lists, so the very active contributors to the site. Whatever you edit, well, naturally, you'll just add it to your watch list. So you can log in once a day and, and take a look at the articles that you're interested in and make sure that they're still good. So there are people who camp out on various uh, parts of the site. So you would think. Well, what about some obscure area like 
trains. We have tons of articles about trains, the history of trains. Well, there are hobbyists who are very much experts in that field who add all those articles to their watch list and if you come in and you make a goofball edit to the train section, they'll find it within a few hours because some one of them will come in and take a look at your edit and see that it's nonsense. Um, we have things like the new pages tool. The new pages tool shows every new page that comes on the site. So we have to le uh, delete a lot of new pages. Mostly it's things like ASDF, ASDF, people just writing nonsense for the first time. Um, and so we're monitoring. So everything that's done on the site is being watched and is being monitored by people. And that's a really important part of it. We have the page history. Uh, the page history, this is one of the things that, that our wiki software does better than most, uh, which is we make it really easy for you to see what has changed. If you had to, every time somebody edited an article, if you had to reread the whole thing from scratch, you could never pay attention all the way through every single day to watch it. Instead, all you do is you can click on any two versions and click compare. So you can go back to the last version that you personally edited or you can go back to the last version of someone you trusted. You can do a comparison and you can see very quickly, it's highlighted in red, what has changed. You can see the paragraphs that have changed. They're, they're in green and yellow. So this makes it very easy for you to come back and look at an edit and say, was this good or not? Was this sensible or not? And so that's a big part of what people do. Another part of the way the whole thing works is that all of the, all of the methods and, and rules and things like that all come organically from the community. Uh, the software does not enforce the social rules of the site um, in almost every single case. So I'll give you an example here. This is an example from the Votes for Deletion page, which has recently been renamed to Articles for Deletion for complex reasons inside the community. It's a long debate. But the Votes for Deletion page is where people go if it's a borderline case and you can't decide whether to delete it. So if, you, if somebody comes in and writes a new article and the title of the article is ASDF, ASDF, and the entire text is, Hi, Mom, any administrator can just delete it. It's really no big deal. And there's 600 administrators in the English Wikipedia. But if it's something like this, this is a film called Twisted Issues. And the first person who nominates it says, uh, this is supposedly an underground film from 1988, but I can't find very much. It fails the Google test. The Google test is you look it up in Google, and if you can't find it, it probably doesn't exist. It's not an infallible <laughs> test. There are actually some things which exist which are not in Google, but they're increasingly rare. And uh, so you know, it failed the Google test. Fame is doubtful, so delete, delete. But then somebody says, wait a minute, keep it. I just found it. It's in the, uh, it's a uh, psychopunk splatter comedy. It was named in 20 underground films you must see in the Film Threat Video Guide. Uh, somebody else says, hey, you know, I found it on IMDb. It exists. Keep, keep. So people say clean up and keep. What's interesting about the way this works is although it's votes for deletion and although people are voting either delete or keep, um, any administrator who comes through to do cleanup on this page, and there are a group of people who make this their hobby, can come through and say, well, even if it's 29 to 2, the administrator can say, you know what, these last two uh, actually gave a good reason. And so I'm going to hold off on deleting it. I'm going to put this aside, and we're going to keep it. The decision is to keep it because uh, new information came up. So what's interesting about this is although we call it votes for deletion, uh, it's actually more of a dialogue. It's a debate. And sometimes this actually turns into a big debate, people discussing what should be done. Very often, programmers come to us and they say, well, everybody's wasting a lot of time. The administrators have to go through and manually figure out what to do. Why don't we automate this process? Why don't we have it be an actual vote for deletion? And there'll be a certain period of time, and the votes will be tabulated, and then the article will be deleted automatically. Well, this shows you why we avoid that. We really want to keep the human aspect, the human judgment, the human community, and that the software does not enforce the rules. So how is Wikipedia governed? So we've got this large community of people. How do we actually organize the community? How do we keep it, uh, keep it good? How am I doing on time? Good? So Wikipedia governance is a very confusing but a workable mix of consensus. And so by consensus, what I mean is we really, really discourage people from voting on the content of the articles. If you're going to vote on the content of the articles, then what can happen? The negative side effect there is you look around the room and you say, well, it looks like I've got about 70% support for my view. To hell with the 30%. We don't need to listen to the minority view. We can just write the article one way and say, well, we voted on it and that's the way it is going to be. But if there's really that kind of dissent, then there's almost always a way to write the article so that it's better, so that it's richer, so that it is more satisfying to more people. The simplest way to do that, we call it going meta. Instead of saying, the answer, we talk about the major views. And, and you describe those views in a way that's satisfactory to everybody. This works really well even on very hot button issues like abortion. 
people are never going to agree about the issue of abortion, but they can agree the Catholic Church said this, Planned Parenthood said that, things like that can actually be a, a, and a way to get consensus. And so consensus works very, very well. On the other hand, we do have some democracy. We have some voting. Uh, some of the times it's, it's things like uh, votes for deletion. We, we needed a way to, for there to be an answer at the end of the day. You've got a bunch of people saying keep and delete. It's perfectly acceptable for an administrator to say, well, it was 80%, so I deleted it. That's a good answer. Um, very often, though, uh, the point of the voting is not to have a binding vote, but as a means of creating or sustaining a consensus. So uh, an example of something that might need to be voted on, suppose we have two photos of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, they're both pretty nice, but they're a little bit different from each other, and people are trying to decide which one to have in the article, and maybe they're fighting about it. There's not room for both in the article, let's suppose. And so people will say, well, let's just have a vote. Let's just, let's just poll, and let's just see if all of the interested parties, what do we want to do? Well, in cases like that, what usually can happen is there are many, many people who are perfectly reasonable people who say, well, I prefer A or I prefer B, but if everybody else disagrees with me, then I'm willing to, to let it go. It isn't that important. And so you'll see a vote. The vote will end up being 80-20. 20% will then say, it's okay. Yes, I see everybody's against me, and it's not that big of a deal. I'll just let it go. So the vote is not a binding mechanism to ram it down their throats, but it's a way of sort of assessing the community view and seeing if people can, can accept uh, the compromise. There's a certain amount of aristocracy within the community. Um, an example of this would be given in the votes for deletion. One of those users who, who, um, who voted to keep was Rick Kay. Rick Kay is a very famous administrator in uh, English Wikipedia. He does a lot of work on votes for deletion. His vote is going to tend to carry more weight than somebody who just showed up for the first time and said, delete it, it sucks, right? So there is a, a certain amount of this kind of respect within the community for longtime contributors, people who've been around, people who know the traditions. Uh, an example of this I like to give, Angela Beasley is on the board of the Wikimedia Foundation. She was elected from the community with more than twice the number of votes of the person who didn't get elected. Uh, she's a very popular, very powerful uh, Wikipedian. And I always say within the English language Wikipedia, um, Angela could break any rule of Wikipedia and nobody would complain because she's that important. Um, on the other hand, what gives her that power is that she's the one person who you know would never, ever, ever, ever break a rule of Wikipedia. And in fact, I like to say she's the only person who actually knows all the rules of Wikipedia. <laughs> she's, she's famous. You can ask a question in the IRC chat room, and she'll, almost before you can hit enter to ask the question, she'll come back with the link which tells you where the policy is about that. So, uh, so those kinds of things, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of prestige and respect within the community that if you come into the community, you do good work, you can gain power and respect within the community, and that's one of the ways that we reward people for doing quality work. Then there's, a, there's monarchy, and that's my role in the community. Um, <laughs> twice now, when I've given this talk in Germany, the next day in the newspaper, the headline said, I am the Queen of England, <laughs> which isn't exactly what I said, but um, the point of that, this part of my talk is to explain that I view my role uh, as being something akin to the British monarchy in that my power should be steadily decreasing over time as we hand off the functions that I used to perform <laughs> into the community, that we basically are growing institutions in the community uh, that will be sustainable over the long haul. So there's a few things to be said about this. In the free software world, and so if, if you look at projects like uh, the Linux kernel or Apache or other, pro or uh, like Perl, there is a long tradition of the benevolent dictator model. So this is the one person in the community who everybody trusts, and when a decision has to be made, ultimately, uh, uh, if consensus can't be reached, then what goes into the Linux kernel is up to, up to Linus Torvalds. What goes into Perl is up to Larry Wall. Well, that model works well when you've got a group of volunteers who are trying to work uh, without resorting too much to formal decision-making processes and committee votes, which can be a disaster. It can work very well because very often it's more important to make a decision than to make perfectly the right decision. You can fight forever and never get anywhere. So that model works very well for a small group. However, there are some questions as to whether or not it's scalable to a really large group. And then there's also, in my mind, there's the moral propriety. I have no interest in being the benevolent dictator of all human knowledge. I don't think that's appropriate for me to do. Um, on the other hand, the role that I do play in the community is still quite important, and I can give an example of that. Uh, we recently had a, a situation where a neo-Nazi website discovered Wikipedia. 
and they discovered that we had a votes for deletion page. And they said, well, there's 40,000 of us. We're going to overwhelm Wikipedia. We're going to take it over. We're going to delete all the articles we don't like. So they picked out an article they wanted to have deleted. They nominated it, and then there was a vote. And 18 of them showed up, which was pretty impressive, but that's Nazi math for you. 18 is not exactly 40,000. Um, <laughs> they, so the, that particular vote was something like 85 to 18. There was really no danger of them overwhelming the site, but people in the community were worried about this. They said, well, what are we going to do if they get more organized? What if they brought in 100 people? Do we have to delete it? And I said, this is my role in the community. This is part of why we still have this idea of a constitutional monarchy is that I'll just change the rules. Like, they can't, <laughs> it's Calvin Ball, if you're familiar with that. It, we, we, don't, we don't have to worry that our democratic ideals and procedures will be overwhelmed by an outside influence. My, my job in the community is to defend the community, defend the quality of our work. And what we will do if we have a big problem like that is that I am still empowered to say, no, this is ridiculous, they're all banned, that's end of story. We're, this is, we're not gonna let that happen. That's really important because it enables us to, to proceed a little bit fearlessly with social experiments. We can say it's perfectly fine to have an arbitration committee to settle disputes and we don't have to worry that the arbitration committee is going to go out of control and do whatever because I'm going to make sure that it doesn't. That's still a little bit too much power for me to have in the long run. But as our institutions mature, it's less and less often the case that it's ever for me to have to do anything like that. And so, so far so good. The point about this all is that Wikipedians are flexible about our social processes. We value the, the end result um, rather than the methodology. And I feel it would have been a big mistake for us if we had very early on committed ourselves to a very fanatical devotion to voting on the content of the articles or something like that because then those kinds of things can be subverted. We still preserve a very fluid sort of ambiguity and human judgment about the whole process. So what are the core principles of the Wikimedia Foundation? So one of the core principles is free knowledge. Um, everything that we do is under a free license. And this is really important, too, when you think about these governance issues. How do you make sure that I'm not going to go out of control? Well, one of the ways is that if I don't respect the wishes of the community, ultimately, they can take all the content, all the software, they can start the project again somewhere else. And so that's a, that's a very important part of our social compact, that um, the, the right to fork is extremely important. Within the project, the free license does a couple of interesting things. It decreases the individual sense of ownership and it increases a sense of shared ownership. So what this means is a lot of collaborative writing projects falter when people feel this is my essay and I don't want anyone editing my essay without my permission. This wouldn't work for such a large scale project as what we're trying to do. The fact that everything is freely licensed helps people to understand that from the beginning. It says right on the site, don't submit unless you, know, unless you respect that it. it's going to be freely distributable. It's going to be edited mercilessly. You have to deal with that from the beginning. That's part of what we're doing here. Um, another factor is the, the second, the, the last group here. It enhances the popularity of Wikipedia and because the attribution requirement extends our brand name recognition. So this point is one that I make when I'm talking to internet companies a lot because a lot of people still have the idea that the way to build a popular website is to have exclusive content that no one else has, build a wall around it, and everybody's going to be forced to come to you. Well, guess what? The web just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way at all. What we do, we give everything away. You can take our stuff and copy it. You can put it on your web page today. The one thing that you do have to do is follow the terms of the license. And one of the ways you can follow the terms of the license is to link back to us. This gives us a lot of rank with Google because lots of people copy our content and link back to us. It puts our name out there. People say this article comes from Wikipedia. And the net result is not that, well, since we give everything away, everybody goes to all the other websites. The net result is you saw our traffic. It just goes up, 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 up. And so for, uh, for this point, I think that's a surprising type of point to a lot of people that by giving everything away, we get a lot more traffic back. Another core principle, and this is really goes to the very foundation and the very basic um, uh, principles of everything that we're doing, is our neutral point of view policy. Um, we come, as Wikipedians, we come to Wikipedia from very diverse political, cultural, religious backgrounds. How do you get people who may disagree about almost everything to work together collaboratively? One of the important things that makes that work is our, our very firm policy of neutrality. If there's a controversial issue, Wikipedia itself must not take a stand on that issue we simply describe all of the relevant viewpoints fairly. Turns out this is something that people who disagree about a lot of things can still do. Uh, it's a social concept of cooperation 
that helps us to avoid some, some deep philosophical issues. So if you want to talk about truth or objectivity, um, you can argue forever about what is the truth about some controversial topic and you won't get anywhere. Those concepts are not helpful in a social context. What is helpful is our neutral point of view policy because that en enables, it gives people a hook to find a way to cooperate. Uh, it turns out that even some very ideological people are quite good at neutrality. Uh, that's a little bit surprising, but it turns out if you are really dedicated to some particular ideology and you've really studied it, you're comfortable letting the other side speak. Uh, that's not a problem. As long as your, your view is presented fairly, you don't mind the other side speaking. Uh, the, the people who I find have the most trouble with this are people who are not so ideological. They lean one way, but they're a little nervous about their own views. They don't have confidence in their own ideas, and they're a little afraid for the other side to be presented, and so they want to squelch that. We don't really have a huge problem with that. Wikipedians tend to be very, very smart people. Um, it's a pretty geeky hobby, so you can imagine. Uh, another core principle is free software. Uh, our, our wiki engine is uh, licensed under the GNU GPL, which is the major leading free software license. We use all free software on the site. So GNU Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. We use a few other pieces of less uh, well-known software. All of it's under a free license. This is really important because it's, it isn't just that you can take the content, um, which doesn't do you much good if you don't have the software to be able to actually edit it or do something with it. You can take everything and you can fork and you can set up a competing website and you can try to get people to come and edit it. And all, everything is available to you to do that. So let's see, how much time have we got? I'm, how, how, that's, that's 50 minutes, so I'm not gonna do this next part. Um, I'm gonna take questions. This, this, whole, this is a whole new section. Yeah, you've got some more. You've started, like, you've got about, it started at 20, yeah. you've got about 15 minutes. Okay, we'll do it quickly. Hilbert's problem. In 1900, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> in, in, in 1900, um, the mathematician David Hilbert posed 23 problems. There were 10 that were announced at a conference, uh, International Conference of Mathematics. The full list was published later. And these problems came, became very influential in the course of mathematics. Um, and so this whole list of problems, most of them have been solved by now. There's still a, a few that are are outstanding and there's a couple that were, it was basically decided they were too vague and, and no one can solve them. They're not really well posed problems. Um, and this inspired me. So I'm one of the, the people who's deeply involved in the free culture movement. And I wanted to say, well, what are the 10 things that we should be doing? What are the 10 major problems in the free software, in the free culture movement, things that we should be solving? And so these are 10 challenges for the free culture movement. I call these uh, 10 things that will be free rather than 10 things that must be free because I didn't want it to seem like uh, sort of an impotent political demand. These are things that I believe can happen, I believe will happen, uh, but not by some inexorable processes, but because people can choose to make them happen. People can actually take up these projects and do them. Uh, this is designed to spark and inspire innovative work and none of these ideas are original to me. Um, I only listen to focus attention. So in the best uh, traditions of the free culture movement, I just copied everything from somebody else. Um, <laughs> except for this one, this was my idea. Free the encyclopedia. Uh, this is what Wikipedia is doing. Uh, in English and German, if you've got a broadband internet connection, our, our mission is done. And in some of the other languages, it's nearly done. The English Wikipedia is not perfect. It is an encyclopedia, it is high quality. There's still a lot of work left to be done on it, but as far as I'm concerned, um, Anyone in this room, you've got your free encyclopedia. Just, just get online, there it is. Uh, there's still tons of work to be done in terms of getting it offline, all those kinds of things. The other language is not far behind, but there's still a lot of work left to do globally. Uh, free the dictionary, so this is the Wiktionary project. Again, this is one that we're working on. Uh, it's not as far along as Wikipedia, it's picking up steam. Uh, one of the things that we need for Wiktionary is support for software development. If you think about an encyclopedia article, the encyclopedia articles are free-form text, and that's a natural medium for an encyclopedia article. But a dictionary entry is inherently structured data. Uh, there's, there's synonyms, there's antonyms. These things should be in tables. They should be cross-referenceable. Right now, Wiktionary is being produced using templates, uh, but it's still ultimately free-form text. The templates give it a certain regularity, which is going to enable us to convert it to a proper system in the future. But for right now, uh, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. There is some, some work going on in this area, but we need volunteers. So if you're a software developer looking for something cool to do, this is a great area to work in. Free the curriculum, this is the Wikibooks project. Uh, a complete curriculum in every language. 
it isn't just the Wikibooks project. There are a lot of other projects out there in the world who are working on freely licensed textbooks. And I'm not entirely sure that Wikibooks is going to be the central project that achieves this goal. There are a lot of questions about the wiki methodology in writing textbooks that are very much unanswered. Can we ever get the kind of coherency we need? Can you write a sustained long work like a textbook in a coherent manner? It's one thing about if I say to you, uh, encyclopedia article about the Eiffel Tower, you all know pretty much what that's supposed to look like. You can imagine it should talk about the history, it should talk about how tall it is, where it is, there should be a picture over here. But if I say uh, introduction to chemistry textbook, there could be a lot of different opinions about the ordering of the material and things like that. So is the wiki process the best model or is it is a better model to get together small groups of professors to collaborate and decide these things? I don't know, but it's going to happen uh, one way or the other. Free the music. Uh, and I'm not talking about Britney Spears, you know. Uh, the most amazing history are public domain, but there aren't that many public domain recordings that exist. Most of the recordings of Mozart and Beethoven are copyrighted and they're not freely shareable. As a matter of fact, the scores so that orchestras can produce it, they're also proprietary derivative works. People are doing modern arrangements or even converting the old manuscripts into notation that's suitable for modern orchestras. That stuff should be taken and put under a free license. And then one of the things that can happen is that either volunteer orchestras, student orchestras, community orchestras can actually record, play and record the music and release it on the internet for free. Now this won't be necessarily uh, you know, the, the, the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra or any famous orchestra, um, but it's going to be pretty good. So if you take a, a, a good university orchestra, they can actually produce quite a good uh, recording and I think that will be very valuable to the world. Free the art. So these are two paintings. This is, uh, this is Shakespeare over here and Anne of Denmark. These paintings reside in the museum in uh, London. These paintings are 400 years old. Well, we've gotten uh, letters uh, from lawyers, complaints from lawyers from the British uh, the Museum of Portrait, the National Portrait Gallery, saying uh, these are in our museum and we have the digital rights and you're not allowed to produce this. Uh, this is an ongoing fight that we're having. We, I get complaints from museums who have artwork that's in the public domain and they claim to control the digital rights. Uh, this is an absurd situation and our response is, there's the photo in the article. We're not taking this stuff down. Uh, this is our shared culture. What I've, what I've taken to doing, I answer these by, I give the, 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 the response, the legal response, we believe this is fair use, we believe this is public domain. And then I have a whole paragraph about, you should be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> If you go to most museums websites, they have a very noble mission statement about our goal is to educate the public and share our shared cultural history and so forth. And then they go around trying to jack up Wikipedia for fees. Forget it, you know, it isn't gonna happen. Uh, mostly they don't wanna take us to court over these kinds of things because they know we'll win. This stuff is public domain, we have a fair use claim to it, it's really no problem. Uh, what they try to do is intimidate people who can be intimidated, but we're too big now to intimidate, so, or we think we are anyway, we'll see. Um, Free the file formats, okay? This is something that a lot of people uh, are vaguely aware of because you've been forced to upgrade your, your Microsoft software again and again and again because suddenly all of your friends are sending you files that are in the software format, the file format from two years ago and you can't read them anymore. Proprietary file formats are actually worse than proprietary software because they leave you with no ability to switch at a later time. If you're using some program that is itself not free software, that's unfortunate. But if all of your data is going into a format that you can never be able to read in the future with free software, that's a huge, huge problem. Your data is controlled. Uh, there is considerable progress here. And one of the most important things about this is that the European Union has uh, been struggling politically over the last couple of years with the issue of software patents. And so far, they continue to reject software patents. That's really important because a patented file format means for 17 years, no one else can write a program to get the data out. That's a really bad thing. Uh, this is actually one of the points I made. I made this, I was given this talk at Harvard a couple weeks ago and somebody made the point. Uh, this is something that's really important for librarians who are talking about archiving in the long run. If you've got old data files that's in some proprietary format, how are you ever going to be able to read it? Uh, the, the, the fact is we've got huge amounts of digital content which is going to be unreadable in the future unless we're very careful. One of the solutions to that is if you make sure that it's readable by free software, that software can be maintained, it can be updated, you can actually do something about it without worrying about paying huge fees in the future to some company to 
to dig your data back out. Free the maps. There's this really cool guy in London called Stefan Magdalinski. And when I first told him I had this idea for coming up with 10 things, he said, oh, you've got to do map data. That's one of the most important. He said, what can be more public domain than basic information about location on the planet? So this is essentially, uh, there's GIS software, geodata. This is, this is all about the maps, the streets, the names of things. This is really important in the future because of we want to see open competition in mobile data services. Um, there's a lot of interest in this sort of thing from uh, the cell phone companies. There's, a, there's actually a split in motivation between the companies that make phones and the carriers. The companies that make phones, they want your phone to be really cool and they want you to buy a new phone. That's what they're fundamentally all about is selling phones. The carriers are fundamentally about charging you for every piece of data that flows through your phone somehow. So they're perfectly happy with proprietary data that you can only get through them, whereas the cell phone companies are very interested in, in more open things. With the growth of Wi-Fi, the growth of SIP, uh, these are technologies that are going to enable you to make phone calls without going through the cell phone network. You can do it over the internet, things like this. These things are growing and coming, but it's very important that we have the tools available, freely available, so that entrepreneurial people can build services on top of this stuff that will be an atmosphere of competition rather than a situation where there's a handful of companies who control what you're doing because, of course, then they can charge you a lot of money for it. Free the product identifiers. Now we're really getting into some fairly obscure seeming stuff, but it's really important. Um, increasingly on the internet, small producers can have a global market. Uh, this is the idea of the long tail, the idea that if you look at the sales of, for example, at Amazon, and you look at the hits, that's the curve of the most popular things, that's a part of their sale. But then as that curve goes out into the less and less popular stuff, it turns out that the tail is much bigger than the head, and that in the long tail is where the business really is. Well, one of the things that's going on is that there are business models that work uh, by aggregating the long tail, by having lots and lots of people. This is eBay. There's tons and tons and tons of stuff on eBay that no one retailer could ever have, but eBay empowers, uh, they, they aggregate the long tail and they're, they're able to make a living doing that. Well, it's very important that we have competition among these aggregators. And one of the things that we need is independent product identifiers because to put all that stuff into a database so people can actually find it, you need unique identifiers. So for books, for example, we have the ISBN code. So every book has an ISBN. But Amazon also has their own competing system called ASIN, Amazon something identifier numbers. A lot of people on the web use the ASIN. Um, if you're an Amazon affiliate and you're linking to Amazon and you're trying to make your 5% on your book, you can just look up the ASIN code. Uh, that's a really bad idea. If you've built a website and you've got 300 books that you've linked to, uh, if you want to switch from selling on behalf of Amazon to selling on behalf of Barnes & Noble, you've got a big problem because Barnes & Noble doesn't have the Amazon numbers. So you, you've cut yourself out of uh, that kind of competition. Whereas if you use the ISBN, which you can still do at Amazon, that's a great thing. So I have this idea for long tail identification numbers. And this would mean that all kinds of people, craftspeople making jewelry, clothes, anything like that would have an easy and convenient way of obtaining an identifier number, which then people can build all kinds of services on top of. Services which review the products, services which sell the products, all those kinds of things. So uh, there are people who are working on this and it's really interesting stuff. Uh, free the search engine. Uh, transparency uh, in finding things is critically important. Uh, now, I love Google. I think Google's great. Uh, I don't have a problem with Google, but everything that they do is a little mysterious to the rest of us. It's a black box. You don't know exactly why things are rated highly in Google or why they aren't. I, or why they aren't. I think it's really important that we have search engines out there with algorithms that are publicly available and they can be scrutinized and improved. And I think there are actually um, business models available uh, right now that could do this. Uh, basically, the search engines make their money through advertising. Uh, they don't make their money through selling proprietary technology for the most part. And so you just have a search engine where you have advertising and then you publish everything that you're doing. You publish your algorithm. You publish everything. You give away your data set. You give it all away. You might think, well, why would it be popular? Couldn't everybody just copy it? And my answer to that is exactly the same answer as at Wikipedia. We give everything away and yet we're enormously popular. I don't think that's a problem. So I think this is going to happen. I think we're going to see some search engines develop that have uh, free software. They may either come from this free software movement or they may come from um, some of the lesser players who have not been able to compete. Somebody like AltaVista could publish their entire algorithm, for example, because they're not doing so well. This would be a chance. 
Uh, and finally, free the communities. Uh, Wikipedia demonstrates the power of a free community. Um, most of the places that you go on the web when you participate in the community, you're essentially signing everything away by the terms of service of the site. Even a site like the BBC, which is fantastic. I, I love the BBC. It's a great organization. They take really seriously their commitment to the public good. They take really seriously the community aspect of what they're trying to do. And yet their terms of services are brutal. You go on, if you submit to a message board at the BBC, it basically says, we own it. You can never touch it again. Everything belongs to us and maybe your children too. And it's really pretty abusive. And that's the way most websites are. Well, I believe that consumers of web forum and wiki services and things like this should care about the license. They should care about the license because uh, if the company that's hosting you decides to shut you down or censor you, you want to make sure that you're able to take everything that you've built, all your content, and move. And that's really important uh, in the future, I think. Uh, the question is, are you a serf living on your master's estate or are you free to move? That's the really the core question that I would ask myself. Um, I have a company, WikiCities, which is for profit, so it has advertising. But everything that we're doing at WikiCities is under a free license. We're using the same software as Wikipedia. We, all the content is under a free license. And that's important because we think we're able to attract communities. So you want to build the, the ultimate um, uh, Tar Heels fan site, right? Uh, you don't want to do that at a place where they're going to claim to own all the data. You want to get together a group of friends and create something. Do it somewhere where you're able to actually take the data if you're not treated well by the company. That's really important. So that's my final point on free the communities. Thank you.